And a lot of women ask, what is menopause? Am I in it? Have I gone through it? What is this? Um, and we define that clinically as when a naturally menstruating woman um, has gone for more than a year without a menstrual cycle. And that's a sign that the ovaries have, have stopped ovulating um, and have decreased the amount of hormones, particularly estrogen that they are making. Um, so this is typically a natural part of the aging process, but there are sometimes if we have um, surgery that removes the ovaries that would put us into a surgical menopause um, or that there are certain medications, um, particularly things like cancer treatments that could shut down and make those ovaries no longer active. But on average, most women will transition through menopause at age 51, um, really anytime between age 40 up until 59 is uh, within the realm of normal for women to go through menopause. Then we defined um, postmenopause as that period once we've made it past that year without a menstrual cycle. Now, perimenopause are the years leading up to the last menstrual, that final menstrual cycle. Um, and so for most women that this can start to occur as early as their mid thirties um, or more often in their forties, it can be as early as 10 years preceding the last and final menstrual cycle. And um, that's going to lead to lots of fluctuations in what our hormones are doing. I always say that it's as if our brain's having to work harder to stimulate those ovaries. And so there's a lot more erratic changes in what the hormones are doing. And, and we see that with more irregular cycles, that sometimes the cycles can be um, very light or heavy. They can become irregular or dysfunctional. And that's always something to bring up to your provider though, um, as if things are becoming more heavy or irregular. We'll talk more about why we want to see an, you know, an OBGYN to be able to, to talk about those things. Um, but this is a time frame that there are going to be some of the most intense changes in what our hormone levels are doing. And this slide here just talks about, is demonstrates what in a naturally menstruating woman, how much variation there is in our hormones just at baseline. So you can see that that light pink um, graph is going to be our estrogen levels, which is one of the hormones that's really going to be responsible for a lot of changes um, that we see in menopause. But you can see how already at baseline, we're having lots of fluctuating um, estrogen levels on a monthly basis. Um, and all of those are changes that occur with ovulation. And so as those hormone levels start to um, you know, eventually decrease, that that's going to, we can see our graph of um, symptoms associated with those life stages. So perimenopause is something that's often in our mid thirties to forties where we can have more mood swings, um, cramping, some irritability, um, more PMS symptoms. As we're going through menopause, as we're in that year of not having menstrual cycles, but really having this dramatic decrease in what our estrogen levels have done can oftentimes lead to things like hot flashes and night sweats um, and, and sometimes things like a loss of libido um, and difficulty sleeping at night. And then after we've gone through menopause, um, in that, that postmenopausal stage that we can start to have symptoms of, of our bones responding to that loss of estrogen and some of the other um, GYN tissues um, like the vaginal tissue responding to that loss of estrogen um, and, and causing more dryness and, and things like heart disease can also become more prevalent. So this just physically demonstrates how, um, how some of those symptoms uh, can arise. And, and so sometimes that there can be the mood swings, hot flashes, night sweats, decreased libido, irregular periods, um, and some thinning of the vaginal tissue that starts with those decreasing estrogen levels. And perimenopause, we've talked a lot about, that's a temporary 
time frame um, that on average women will ex can experience some of those symptoms for up to 10 years before their final menstrual period. Um, but, but it is a finite period of time. And things that we'll talk more about what, what we can do to help with those symptoms. And then as we get further out from menopause, that things like vaginal dryness, um, difficulty holding our urine um, and having issues with our bladder, um, a decreased interest in, in sex, and sometimes more uncomfortable sex can become more common and issues with our bones and, and thinning of the bones. And then oftentimes I get asked the question, well, if we just add estrogen back, will that fix everything? And well, we do have um, you know, hormone therapy that's available for when that's appropriate, it's really only FDA approved and really most indicated to help to treat things such as hot flashes, vaginal dryness, and can be used for women who have low bone mass, which is a precursor to osteoporosis. Uh, but it certainly should not be used to help with any changes in cognitive function. If there's sometimes issues with any memory loss, um, and, and it should not be used to prevent um, heart problems or heart disease. And there are risks, as we know, with any medication that there can be a long list of um, you know, pros and cons to that. And so the risk of adding anything that contains estrogen in it um, into you know, adding more estrogen can increase the risk of things such as um, heart disease, heart attacks, stroke, blood clots, um, and breast or uterine cancer if that's you know, not um, monitored or used with another type of, of hormone. Um, that women who have a personal history of breast or uterine cancer should not use estrogen. Women who've had a history of blood clots, a heart attack, heart disease, or stroke should also not use estrogen. Um, so certainly talking to your provider if that's something that you're interested in. But today we're going to be talking about what are those dietary changes and lifestyle modifications that we can do to help to lead our healthiest lives and to also help to alleviate some of these symptoms. And our North American Menopause Society recommends that women should try these lifestyle modifications for at least three months before initiating any prescription medication anyways. So for things like hot flashes, well, what causes that? We know that it's from a shift in the estrogen levels. The exact mechanism is not clear to us just yet. Um, we think that there's something about how that hormone influences where we regulate our body temperature within our brain. Um, but it is the most common symptom of menopause. And a lot of those symptoms can last anywhere from about three to eight years of those feeling bothersome um, to a woman. Not everybody will experience those, but up to about 75% of women at some point in their life will experience things like hot flashes. It's important to know that they do eventually get better with time, but for some women, they can be so debilitating to their day-to-day -day that they do you know, seek treatment to be able to alleviate symptoms. And so what sorts of lifestyle activity can help with symptoms? Um, things like regular exercise. We know that being able to get our heart rate up, um, being able to you know, have that good cardiovascular exercise is one thing that does help to decrease the frequency of hot flashes. Maintaining a healthy weight. Um, women who have a higher body mass index have a tendency to have more hot flashes. Sometimes things like relaxation techniques, um, meditation and yoga can be helpful, um, but also being able to dress in layers, being able to keep you know, a, a fan or some cooling gel or spray close by can help to reduce that length of, the, of a hot flash when it comes on as well. And definitely avoiding tobacco. We know tobacco um, and, and smoking is one thing that definitely will worsen hot flashes. And I will turn it over to Alyssa to talk about um, foods that we want to avoid um, during menopause to help with symptom relief. 
Absolutely. So, you know, some of you may find that certain foods may trigger hot flashes for you. Um, so what we know is that caffeine and alcohol can potentially trigger hot flashes. Um, if not trigger, um, they can make hot flashes feel worse. Um, so if you notice that caffeine and alcohol um, contribute, you know, contribute to hot flashes for you, um, I would recommend making sure when you um, you know, are drinking alcohol, um, you know, do it in moderation. Usually that's, you know, one drink um, for women in the day. Um, and for caffeine, um, certainly if this is a trigger for you, you may want to, to limit this. In addition to triggering hot flashes, caffeine and alcohol can also um, disrupt sleep patterns. And we know that is something that can certainly worsen um, through menopause. So if you notice that this is, um, some, you know, can mess, you know, can disrupt your sleep patterns, I would recommend for alcohol drinking it around three hours before going to bed. And for caffeine, um, around four to six hours before going to bed, if you notice that it's, um, it's disrupting your sleep. Um, in addition, although there's not a lot of research kind of showing any evidence between um, spicy foods and hot flashes, um, some of you may find that spicy foods can, you know, um, trigger this for you or can make hot flashes worse. So if you notice that that is something that um, can make hot flashes worse for you, I would recommend, you know, trying to limit that if possible. Some foods that can help with alleviating hot flashes. One is omega-3s. Um, so this is a type of fat that we find in foods, actually helps in reducing inflammation in the body and may potentially also help with reducing hot flashes. So we get omega-3s from your fatty fish like tuna, salmon, mackerel. We also get them from non-fish sources, including flaxseed, chia seeds, hemp seeds. So certainly if these are foods that you would like to include, um, great not only to possibly help with um, lowering um, the risk of hot flashes, also good on a heart health standpoint too. In addition to this, um, plant-based foods that contain what are called isoflavins, um, like soy and tofu, um, can potentially also help with reducing hot flashes. And it is best to get this from food sources. And I know Dr. Davis is going to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, um, those isoflavins a little bit more in the presentation. As far as um, something else to make sure you want to, you know, want to want to watch out for is making sure you're getting enough fluid in the day. So with having hot flashes, we're losing water. So we want to make sure we're replenishing our bodies um, with water and making sure we're drinking fluid throughout the entire day, preferably from sugar-free sources. Um, in addition, making sure you get enough water can also help with easing constipation as well too. So some of you may have heard of something called seed cycling as a way to manage um, hot flashes. So the idea of this is um, with seed cycling, it's to, um, it helps to kind of balance hormone levels in an effort to reduce hot flashes. So the idea is eating about two tablespoons of pumpkin and flax seeds for 14 days, followed by two tablespoons of sesame seeds and sunflower seeds for, for 15 days. Um, Unfortunately, there's not a lot of evidence to support the, the use of this in reducing hot flashes. That said, these are certainly um, healthy, healthy fats, um, great sources of fiber and nutrients. So if you do want to include these in your food intake, um, you are certainly more than welcome to. Great, thanks, Alyssa. Um, and so just as we had previously talked about some of the, um, you know, things such as isoflavins and soy-based um, products of whether or not that, that can be helpful. A lot of the over-the-counter supplements are going to have um, a soy-like component or an estrogen-like component that help to relieve some of those symptoms. Now, we would always say we want to talk with the provider um, about whether or not that would be appropriate for us to be able to start some of those supplements. Um, so, the, because depending on what other types of medications we have um, or what other past medical history or medical conditions 
you know, might influence whether or not that's something that we want to be taking. Um, supplements such as black cohosh have been demonstrated to be helpful for hot flashes, but no more helpful than a placebo alone. So something that doesn't have any active ingredients. Um, Estrovin is a popular over-the-counter supplement, which is made up of, of multiple different um, supplements um, and vitamins. And that's something that you know, most of these supplements we want to avoid if we have a personal history of breast cancer or uterine cancer, because they can act like estrogen um, in our system. And, and some of those cancers can be, um, you know, influenced by those hormones. Um, there is a supplement that comes from a bee pollen extract. Things like relizine or femol are, do not have a hormonal component to them, but again, something that should still be discussed with the provider before um, adding any of those supplements. And then the question arises, well, should I eat more soy food? Is that going to help to alleviate um, symptoms and is that safe? So first, just to talk about symptoms. So when we, when we eat any food, we're going to break that down. With soy-based products and soy foods, those are broken down into the isoflavins that Alyssa talked about. And um, one of those components can be helpful for hot flashes. But the thing is, is that everybody's body is different and also the bacteria in our gut that helps to break down some of our food is different as well. So we know that um, the, is the isoflavin, um, the component that can be helpful for hot flashes when we eat soy, uh, which is called S-equal, is, is only made by about a quarter of women in the United States. And we don't know why exactly this is, as opposed to in Asia, about half of the women who um, ingest soy are able to make that S equal component. And whether or not it has to do with what our diet looks like, our genetic component, we're not sure. So um, the moral of the story would be mostly that you can try to integrate soy into um, your diet uh, if you want to. We'll talk about the safety, but in general, that is something that we would consider to be safe when we're eating soy-based foods. And if it's helpful with your with symptoms of hot flashes, you know, great if you have some relief, but knowing that only about a, a quarter of women might find relief with that type of food. So regarding the safety profile of soy food, um, you know, we, we do know that there have been large studies to look at um, women who consume soy in their diet who have a personal history of breast cancer. And they found that there was no difference in women who were um, eating at least one to two servings of a soy-based food daily and the risk of recurrence of breast cancer or survival. So in general, um, that we do feel like soy is something that would be safe to be able to integrate into in our diet, that it's great for protein. Um, and if we're maintaining a more plant-based diet, it can certainly be helpful. But if you have any questions or concerns, things to be able to talk to your healthcare provider or a nutritionist about. So we'll go into some of the, the symptoms of perimenopause with those irregular cycles. We know that a normal menstrual cycle um, can, can be anywhere between every 20, um, 21 days technically, but on average, most women are going to be between 24 until 38 days and um, can have up to eight days of bleeding. Um, if a woman is starting to have more fluctuations in her cycles where it's consistently going on, is going to be longer than every um, 38 days or shorter than every 21 days is a reason that a woman should, should seek care from her healthcare provider and, and talk about what is going on with that cycle. Um, that we know having a prolonged erratic menstrual cycle can increase the risk of precancerous changes within the uterus. Um, and, and those are caused by an imbalance of the estrogen hormone to one of our other female sex hormones, the progesterone. And similarly, 
if women have gone through menopause and um, then experience any, any vaginal bleeding, that's always a reason to talk to your healthcare provider because that could be um, a, a sign of something going on within the uterus and a concern for some precancerous or abnormal cells inside of the uterus. Um, it can be caused by other things, but it always warrants a workup. So we know that things like endometrial cancer are caused by higher levels of estrogen that are unopposed by that other hormone, the progesterone, that helps to keep things in check. And women who can be at a higher risk are either for using an estrogen alone um, hormone without and still have our uterus, so that can put us at an increased risk. Um, and if we also have a higher body mass index, outside of our ovaries, the other um, you know, organ that makes our estrogen is going to come mostly from our fatty tissue. So the more fatty tissue we have, that that can lead to having higher levels of estrogen, but that can be harmful to our uterus. And then we'll talk about um, how our metabolism changes over time. We know as we get older each decade that we're, our metabolism is going to slow down. Um, and so just being aware that it, pretty much after age 20, every 10 years, there's going to be a lower amount of caloric intake that we need in comparison to our, our 20 year old self. So being able to um, just be aware of that um, we can also be able to talk to our nutritionist or healthcare provider about what our caloric intake needs are based on our, our weight, our body mass, and our activity levels. And so how does our body change with time and, and why is that metabolism changing? Well, there's a lot of hormonal changes happening. And a lot of these are happening in both men and women, but sometimes things can just feel a lot more amplified as women are going through menopause. So um, in both men and women that will have you know, a change in our cortisol levels, cortisol is that stress hormone level, and it can cause more of that fatty distribution around the abdomen. It can cause a loss of lean muscle mass and more difficulty sleeping. And then the loss of things like leptin that helps us to control our appetite um, and our growth hormone that helps to build muscle, those are starting to go down. We start to have a higher risk of developing things like diabetes just because our pancreas isn't making as much insulin. And then we have more trouble sleeping because there's less melatonin that our body's making. So knowing that um, these, are, these are some natural changes that are happening, but what we can do to counter um, some of that. And I'll turn that over to Alyssa then. Sure. So what are some ways that we can handle a slowed metabolism? One is making sure that you're engaging in physical activity. So we know exercise helps with building muscle. Muscle is going to help, it is more metabolically active. So it helps, you know, increase um, our, our energy, um, energy needs in the day and can help with boosting our metabolism a little bit. So getting physical activity recommended is about 150 minutes of physical, moderate intensity physical activity each week. So it can be anything that you enjoy, whether it's walking, whether it's doing an exercise class, biking, um, doing something that you enjoy and keeping it consistent is so important. In addition, um, one thing to note is making sure that you are being mindful of the types of drinks that you're having. So we know, especially drinks that have a lot of sugar in it, um, sodas, even juices, can tend to contribute to, to weight gain. So making sure that you're mostly drinking water, um, beverages that do not contain um, additional sugar in there is, is really important. In addition, we want to make sure you're drinking enough water in the day. Sometimes we can mistake um, our thirst and hunger cues. So making sure you're drinking at least eight cups or 64 ounces uh, of water fluid each day is, is really important. And we certainly want to be mindful of intake our intake of sweets, um, added sugars, um, which can contribute a lot to our calorie intake. And 
Lastly, you want to make sure you're eating slowly, um, making sure that you are eating slowly to enjoy food. And also, we know that eating slowly can also um, help us to recognize those hunger and fullness cues. So make sure that you um, are doing that at each meal as much as possible. We also want to make sure that we um, are having con um, a consistent intake of meals in the day. Um, one thing that we know is that if we are skipping meals, this can um, this can lead to overeating sometimes at, at the following meal. So having consistent meals in the day helps helps to ensure that we're not overeating. In addition, having regular meals also helps to ensure we're getting the vitamins and minerals that we need in the day. We something that can be helpful, um, especially in, help in preserving our muscle mass, is making sure that we're um, getting some kind of protein element at each meal, preferably from a lean protein source, whether it's um, animal-based or vegetarian-based protein source. And generally speaking, for if you are having an animal-based protein or fish, usually about palm size is a good recommendation for the portion size of that meat. Um, Next, you also wanna to try to make sure you're loading up with uh, vegetables, specifically non-starchy vegetables in your plate. Um, salad, greens, tomatoes, cucumbers, most vegetables you can think of count in this category. And we know those non-starchy vegetables are low in calories, full of fiber, which can help with keeping us full um, without having a lot of um, additional calories in that meal. And then certainly um, consider increasing your intake of those plant-based um, meals or plant-based protein options, not only for those isoflavins, but also um, for the fiber content and for heart health purposes as well. So one thing that we you know, really want to make sure, um, especially with menopause, the, our calcium needs actually do go up and to about 1200 milligrams a day. So our calcium sources um, are certainly gonna include your dairy products, milk, yogurt, um, going for low fat cheeses, and also include your dairy alternatives like almond milk, soy milk. Just keep, um, keep in mind some certain dairy alternatives like so um, almond milk um, do not contain the same amount of protein as your um, soy milk or um, cow's milk. Um, other additional sources of calcium include fish with bones in there, um, like a canned salmon, sardines, um, broccoli, dark green vegetables, and legumes and beans. And recommended is about two to four servings a day of your calcium sources. And then you also want to make sure you're getting enough iron. Um, iron, we, we, we get iron from red meat. We also get it from um, meats, fish, eggs, leafy green vegetables, nuts. Um, and recommended is um, getting about three servings of iron each day for a total of eight milligrams um, of iron each day. Fiber is something that we want to make sure we're getting enough of, especially to help with um, our digestion, also help with filling us up a little bit more at the meal. Um, it's recommended to get about 25 grams of fiber each day, and we get fiber from things like your, mostly your plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, uh, and whole grains like whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, brown rice, um, and when you are increasing your fiber intake, it is important to make sure you're also increasing your fluid intake. So, um, cause that can lead to uh, constipation. So we wanna make sure we're getting about eight cups of water each day once again to, to help with preventing, preventing that. So recommended for your fruit and vegetable intake, usually for fruits, you want about one and a half cups of fruit a day, um, a piece of fruit is essentially considered a, a, a serving or a cup of fruit. Um, and then you want about two cups of vegetables at least um, each day. And certainly enjoy healthy fat servings, things like olive oil, canola oil, usually a good rule of thumb. If your oil is liquid at room temperature, it's usually considered a heart healthy oil. Um, and we wanna keep it to around four to five servings each day. A serving size is say, for example, like a teaspoon of oil um, or about like two tablespoons of nuts. And then for your protein, as we mentioned before, you usually want to keep it to around a palm size at a, at a meal time. Um, so that's anywhere between about three to four ounces. And um, 
you know, this is going to help with preserving muscle mass and also be helpful um, in just protein does have a satisfying quality to it as well too. So it can help us feel full for longer. Some things that nutrients that you do want to watch out for, and some of you may find this on the food label or may already be looking for this, um, sugar and salt, also known as sodium, that's what we we'll usually see it as on the food label. So sugar, typically we want to have less than six teaspoons or less than 24 grams of sugar each day. Um, and when you're looking at the label, it will be mentioned as added sugar. And then for salt or sodium, typically we want less than 2,300 milligrams each day. Um, and if you do have high blood pressure, that is a little less. We wanna keep to less than 2,000 milligrams of sodium each day. Um, some of your culprits of you know, high sodium foods include you know, canned foods, any foods with additional seasoning added to it can sometimes be pretty high in, in sodium. Great. Thanks, Alyssa. So we will go on to talking about how our sleep changes um, after menopause. So we know that about half of women in their 40s to 60s report having common issues with sleep. And this can cause muscle aches, irritability, um, difficulty concentrating during the day, in addition to things like increased heart disease and depression. What we define as insomnia is if women are having um, trouble sleeping more than three nights um, out of the week, um, if that's going on for more than, you know, the more than a month, then that would be a reason to be able to seek um, treatment talking to your care provider. And oftentimes that we'll talk about you know, changes to our sleep hygiene, what lifestyle modifications we can make. And one of the best things rather than trying to, you know, go for a, a medication, whether that's over the counter or a prescription, but there's cognitive behavioral therapy and there are programs out there that are sleep training programs um, that can be very helpful if we are suffering from insomnia. Um, and then, you know, we know that while menopause can cause things like sleep disturbances, there are also other medical conditions that can cause difficulty with sleep. So we should be talking to our healthcare provider about you know, how often that is that we're experiencing difficulty sleeping, and they should be discussing the other potential for things such as obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, depression, anxiety, and some medications can influence how we sleep as well. So when we talk about sleep hygiene, things that we want to avoid is um, really ca no caffeine after lunchtime. Nicotine is a stimulant and that is going to make it more difficult for us to sleep regardless of whatever time that we are using that. So that's something that can be very helpful to just cut out altogether. Screens and any sort, any um, form of blue light is something that we should try to avoid for at least one to two hours before bedtime. Foods that are more spicy or fatty or fried or um, acidic and carbonated beverages can also cause a little bit of GI upset and make it more difficult for us to go to sleep. And then alcohol, well, women think of that as maybe being more of something that is going to be a depressant and makes us more tired. Once it's metabolized, it actually activates our brain. And so that's why um, oftentimes we might wake up in the middle of the night if we've had alcohol later in the evening. So really trying to limit our alcohol intake. What can be helpful for our, um, for our sleep is going to be regular exercise getting natural light during the day, trying to establish a good bedtime routine, um, and then also just keeping the um, temperature very cool. Sleeping at under 67 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be optimal for sleep. And next we'll go on to our bone health. So we said how estrogen certainly impacts um, how um, the, the structure of our bones. Um, the further out from menopause we are, the more at risk we become for things like osteoporosis, which is what I like to say is a silent disease. There's not a lot of aches or pains associated with osteoporosis. 
Um, there are th there's osteoarthritis, or all, also known as arthritis, um, is something that can be associated with aches and pains. But um, osteoporosis itself is simply the change in the structure of our bone. And you can see on the picture the um, difference between that thickness and um, you know, amount of structure to a normal bone, and then in osteoporosis, is how thin and frail that bone can become. And so estrogen does help to protect against bone loss. And we know that um, at the onset of menopause, that there can be a more rapid bone loss, but then that starts to equilibrate and rebuild. But then as we get further out from menopause is when we start to be at risk of things like osteoporosis. So all women should have um, a bone density test who are age 65 or older. We may consider earlier testing for osteoporosis if women have a higher risk, if they've gone through menopause but have a history of um, rheumatoid arthritis, smoking, increased alcohol use, a parent who's had a history of a hip fracture or weigh less than 127 pounds are all risk factors for um, the potential development of osteoporosis. And so Alyssa will tell us a little bit more about eating for strong bones. So we already talked about calcium, um, but calcium and vitamin D are really important for your bone health. Um, we, we know vitamin D um, actually helps with, um, you know, helps with calcium absorption. You can see from the, both the vitamin D and the calcium, um, you know, after age 50, our needs do go up. So for vitamin D, our needs go up to about 800 to 1000 international units a day. Um, for calcium, our needs go up to um, 1200 um, milligrams um, per day. So with vitamin D, that's something that we absorb from, we get from our sunlight. But unfortunately, a lot of the times, you know, especially during winter time, um, you know, we, we don't typically get, a, you know, a lot of vitamin D. So if this is a concern, um, you can certainly talk to your doctor. They can check your vitamin D levels. If your levels are low, um, your doctor is going to likely recommend a vitamin D supplement. There are some foods that are fortified with some vitamin D, um, including uh, milk, um, mushrooms that are, um, produced under UV light also have some vitamin D, but it is pretty hard to meet our vitamin D needs from our food intake. So certainly talk to your doctor more about this. As far as calcium goes, um, calcium, we, we said it comes from your dairy products and we'll actually go into additional calcium sources as well. It is best to get your calcium from the foods that you eat. But if you do have concerns about getting enough calcium, I would recommend talking to your doctor about a possible supplement if there are issues with this. So sources of calcium are gonna certainly include your dairy-based dairy, dairy -based products, milk, yogurts, um, cheeses, um, but they also include um, your dairy alternatives like almond milk, soy milks, rice milks. And in addition, you're also gonna find calcium in things like your dark leafy, dark green vegetables, collard greens, uh, broccoli rabe, even tofu, soybeans, um, are, and even shrimp are great sources uh, of calcium. There are foods and beverages that can actually make it harder for your body to um, absorb calcium. Um, having a high salt intake, um, very, very high protein diets, um, uh, especially if you drink a lot of alcohol and caffeine, all of these can make it harder for your body to absorb calcium. In addition, um, cola beverages specifically, um, are going to have phosphorus in there, which can actually um, make it harder for your body to absorb calcium as well. So just some things to keep in mind. Okay, great. So we are coming to the end of our lecture component, but I think it's always good to keep in mind, um, you know, we say I'm still hot. It just comes in flashes now. So things change, but, you know, keeping good humor is always important. So some final words on menopause, change happens, some good, some bad, but there are options to make the bad less bad. Here are our references for our content today. 
Um, everybody will receive a copy of this PowerPoint slide for those who registered as part of your follow-up emails. And I will hand it over to Dorothy for um, a little a word on um, Veterinary Community Partnership and then our food demonstration. Great. Thanks, Dr. Davis. Um, so I'm going to go through a really quick and simple recipe, um, and I will be very mindful of the time. I know we've got just about a little under 15 minutes left together, and thankfully, overnight oats is a really very fast recipe, so it should not take nearly that amount of time when you put this together for yourself at home. Um, <clears throat> but for us, just walking you through it, we'll just take those few extra minutes, um, especially just to complement um, all of the different nutrients that we are trying to recommend and promote in our diet as we move through um, pre, peri, and postmenopausal changes. Um, so we'll highlight each of those for the ingredients. But in case you missed my brief introduction about Veterinary Community Partnership at the beginning, um, we are a nonprofit organization based in Philadelphia, founded in 2008 by Chef Mark Vetri and another partner. And we empower children and families, as well as members of our larger Philadelphia community, um, to lead healthier lives through fresh food, so we provide tactile hands-on experiences, um, which has been predominantly virtual um, for the last two years, but I'm excited to share that we are back in a lot of in-person spaces, both for our after-school veterinary cooking lab programs um, with Philadelphia School District children, as well as in Camden, um, and also in culinary medicine settings as well. So without any further ado, um, I'm going to just angle the camera down so that we can have a nice view of our demonstration area here. All right, um, and so for this recipe, carrot cake overnight oats, um, this recipe is really the definition of versatility. It's great for batch prep. So really all you need doesn't have to be a fancy jar like this. I often use leftover jars from something that, you know, was a food product I bought and we can, you know, wash and sanitize these and then keep them in all different shapes and sizes. And that is the perfect tool that you need for throwing together something like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive right in. And in a smaller bowl, we're going to start by um, mixing in one cup of our rolled oats. So rolled oats, by definition, I'll just hold it up so you get a nice look at the texture here. Um, they come from whole oat groats. And so we may have heard this word groat before. It is the word for the entire oat kernel minus the hull. And this is the basis of, from which most oat products we know of on the market are created from. So they're steamed and then flattened in a roller mill to varying degrees of thickness. And some of them might be cut as well. Um, that gives that toothsome texture that we find if you enjoy steel cut oats, for instance. So from varying thickness to thin this, we have extra thick oats, old fashioned oats, quick cook oats, and even instant oats. So we might think that there is a really, really large discrepancy in nutrition and the nutrient profile of all of those different oat products. So with the exception of something like instant oats that come in the prepackages containers, while they're certainly convenient, they tend to have a lot of additives, they might have added sugars. So that's something we want to be mindful of. But both rolled oats and instant oats are good sources of soluble and insoluble fiber, beneficial for digestion, as well as satiety and keeping us full. So even in this one cup of rolled oats, which I'm using here, this is a quick cook rolled oats. You can make oatmeal out of this. Um, this contains four grams of fiber and five grams of protein in this one cup alone. So we're gonna go ahead and add that in the bowl here. And next we're gonna add in one teaspoon and a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon and turmeric respectively. So these are anti-inflammatory spices. They're not only delicious and vibrantly colorful and beautiful, but they're tied to increase vasodilation. So that translates to enhanced blood flow in the body, which can be really beneficial during this stage of life and all phases of life. Cinnamon clinically has also been studied and it's demonstrated a very, very modest effect on lowering blood glucose level, which can be something that um, peri and um, menopausal women and postmenopausal women are paying attention to, as there are those shifts in insulin that we learned about from the presentation. So we're adding those spices in here along with our tablespoon of 
whole chia seeds. So we touched on chia seeds as well with Alyssa, who taught us about how they pack a really big nutrient punch. Um, they were highlighted for their omega-3 fatty acids, but they also contain a lot of fiber. So in this one tablespoon alone, there are three grams of fiber, which is very, very concentrated when you think about how we're aiming for 20 to 25 grams of fiber per day. There's three grams alone just in this tablespoon, along with three grams of healthy fats and two grams of protein. So really they are a nutrient powerhouse, but also for the sake of this recipe, they really give this nice thickness and this nice viscosity as they swell up and they um, absorb the liquid that we add. I would recommend not adding more than one tablespoon though. Otherwise it's gonna get too thick and it just could be too gummy and too viscous to really enjoy. But if you play around with a recipe like this, you can play with those proportions. So what we're gonna do is we're just going to mix these together and set these off to the side for the moment while we start to mix some of our wetter ingredients. So in our larger bowl over here, we're going to go ahead and add our one and a quarter cup. This is your milk of choice. So again, we had a really nice overview of the different types of milks um, that would be recommended to drink. So right now I'm using a 2% milk. It's just what I have on hand in my household. Um, but the key here for whatever milk you want to purchase, you really want to be having your eye on that nutrition facts label with an eye on the protein content because not all milks and milk alternatives are created equal. So in this one cup alone, plus the one and a quarter cup, so a little bit extra, there's eight grams of high quality protein and the closest plant um, milk alternatives that even come close to that number per one cup serving are going to be either soy milk or even a pea milk um, made from pea milk protein. Just like Alyssa mentioned, almond milk is definitely fortified with all of those vitamins and minerals that we're looking to include in the diet, like calcium, but they tend to be very, very poor in protein, really only about a gram of protein per eight ounce cup serving. So in here, we've got our milk, which is also the added nutrient bonus of calcium. And then the next thing we're going to add in is our half a cup of a plain Greek yogurt. So this is also packing a really, really big protein punch. We've got 15 grams of protein in here alone, along with nearly 200 milligrams of calcium. So going back to those recommended numbers, if we are aiming for 1200 milligrams of calcium a day, that's going to give you 15% or about one sixth of your needs just in this serving of Greek yogurt alone. And then what it's doing for our recipe is it's also going to help bind everything together. It's going to give it a little bit of tang and it's going to just create the right balance of thickness. Now, if you don't want a really thick overnight oat, you can kind of play around with this. Again, key is versatility here. We could decrease the half a cup down to about a quarter cup of the Greek yogurt, and then we can include a little bit more of our milk of choice, and we're still getting some protein that way as well. So we've got those two added in here, and then the only ingredient that we really have to prep, which of course you could also buy pre-prepped if you want, is our half a cup of grated carrots, because because it is a carrot cake overnight oat recipe after all, and that's not just coming from the cinnamon. So on your box grater, we've got the large size, a extra small size, as well as a medium size grate. Um, I tend to find that while you could use the largest size, um, I think that the medium kind of produces the best results in terms of the size of the carrot shreds. So again, if you're going for quick, simple, convenient, you don't tend to have a lot of carrots around, even though they're a very hearty vegetable, they last in the fridge for several weeks and they're super versatile for both sweet and savory applications. Um, you can definitely buy pre grated or pre shredded carrots. I would just say avoid those types that we throw in salads that tend to be um, kind of long and stringy as those are thicker. Um, and they're just not going to blend as well into this recipe. And also keep in mind that we are adding these shredded and grated carrots into somewhat small jars. So if you have long stringy pieces of carrot in there, it's going to taste great, but it just won't be incorporated in the same way. And when we think about the nutrition profile of carrots, it really boasts a lot. 
It's got an excellent source of vitamin A. So that's really key for eye health as well as our immune system because vitamin A is a natural antioxidant. Um, it's also got vitamin K in them. So that's great for our bone health. That's sometimes an overlooked ingredient when we're thinking about um, bone preservation. We think about calcium and vitamin D, but vitamin K is a really big player for bone health as well. It's also got potassium, which works in concert with magnesium and calcium in helping to lower blood pressure and also aid in lowering cholesterol levels with the soluble and insoluble fiber that carrots contain. So we're going to take this amount here and that's if I'm eyeballing it next to my half cup standard measuring cup right here. If I pack this in, I'd say that's about a half a cup right there. So we're just going to go with this, transfer this into our liquid ingredients. Speaking of hydration and adequate fluid throughout the day, there is some water in these carrots as well. So that's adding to that. And then we're also gonna add in our three tablespoons of raisins. I'm using golden raisins. I just tend to like them, personal preference. Um, but fun fact, raisins even contain a little bit of some plant-based protein. So we mentioned um, in the presentation or Alyssa mentioned rather that iron is something that we don't want to overlook. And so there is even a little bit of an iron bonus in the raisins along with two grams of fiber per one quarter cup serving. So all of these ingredients are really starting to stack up and tally up towards our daily fiber goals just in this one recipe alone, which is great. So for that concentrated sweet to balance everything else we have going on, we're adding in one tablespoon of maple syrup. You can definitely substitute with honey. And if you are being mindful of your concentrated sweets, you can definitely start this recipe by adding only one half tablespoon of maple syrup. Play around with the taste, especially if you care for something less sweet, and then you can play with it as you go. But for this large batch here, we're only using the one tablespoon. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna whisk all of this together first and the orange from the carrots immediately imparts this really, really beautiful hue. And then we're going to go ahead and just combine everything together, our oats, our cinnamon, our turmeric, our chia seeds, it already smells wonderful in here, just got that burst of cinnamon. And so this process, it does say overnight oats as the name of the recipe suggests. However, these really can start to loosen up in a matter of about three to four hours. And so what we're gonna do is for the final stage, we're just gonna transfer these. Like I said, any size jar you have, I will share with you that this is definitely multiple servings. That is, it has so much fiber in it. It's very, very filling. Be hard pressed to find someone who would eat all of this in one setting. And so this is going to be great for batch prep. If you wanna have these on hand, they're great for grab and go. Um, as you make your way throughout the week, you can just simply take one out of the refrigerator and they last for um, a good five days. So all week long. We're going to transfer this into our other smaller bowl. You'll get a hang for your preference size. And we've already given them a good mix. If you're being very, very quick about this type of recipe, um, you could definitely add it straight into your container, into your mason jar. But just word to the wise, it can be very, very difficult to mix it up once it's in here. Um, you could use a tiny fork or something like that. But um, other overnight oat flavors to consider could be something like lemon blueberry, even dark chocolate with fresh raspberries in the morning, pumpkin pie with canned pumpkin and cinnamon, peanut butter banana, tropical, whether you're using um, shredded coconut flakes or some mango if that's on sale or if you're in a place where that's in season. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're going to just refrigerate these for, like I said, at least three hours up to overnight. And then you can enjoy them throughout the week for added nutrition and flavor. You can top with a little bit of coconut flakes. You could add any nut of your choice for extra fiber and healthy fats, like some slivered or even toasted almonds. And then last but not least, for a little bit of a fresh kick, you can even add a little calcium and fiber bonus by adding some fresh orange segments on top. And that'll just really enhance that beautiful orange hue with all of those antioxidants and flavor. So that is our Vetri Carrot Cake Overnight Oat recipe. And I hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much, Dorothy. That looks wonderful. I'm excited to make it. <laughs> My kitchen smells so good right now.
<laughs> I'm sure. And that's great. Now you'll have some, yeah, have a few servings to have around. Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to either put those in the chat um, at the bottom of your screen that there's the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself. Um, the mute button is going to be on the lower left side of your screen. I'll reemphasize everybody who is registered for this session will receive the PowerPoint slides and another copy of the recipe um, so that you have that to be able to reference and make your own overnight oats. I saw one, one question was, can you heat up um, the overnight oats? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it would come out to be a very similar preparation as oatmeal. You can prepare these overnight oats. The idea is that they are served um, cool, chilled, or even let's set them out a little bit to be um, taken on the go and you could consume them at room temperature. If you wanted to enjoy it as a hot dish, you could absolutely transfer this to the microwave or put this on the stove and heat it up for a minute or two and enjoy the same flavor as, as you would hot oatmeal. That sounds like a wonderful suggestion. Especially for a day like today where we need our sweatshirts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're past that. Warm. warm our hands, warm our belly. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining today. And our next session we will have on May, I have May 4th from 5.30 until 7 p.m. We will have a full cook-along session um, with one of our veterinary chefs. So that's going to be specific to making foods that are going to be you know, good for these menopausal symptoms, good for heart health, bone health, all of that good stuff, um, but a full cook-along where you're able to make that meal from start to finish that we allocate an hour and a half in the comfort of your own kitchen, but have um, one of our veterinary culinary chefs to be able to watch as we're doing things and give us some feedback. So that is um, on, our, on our website and that will be on May 4th. And you should also receive emails about that event if you've registered for, for today's event. So thank you.